All right, everybody, I think we are ready to go. Our schedule has been tightened up a little bit because the mayor's schedule has changed, and he is certainly far more important than any of us who are speaking this morning. So we're go I'm going to talk fast. Um, you have a copy of the handout. You should have. It should look like this. Do we not have those? Oh, okay. That's all right. They need the... Um, now they've got the one pager, but there, there should be a handout that looks like this. Is there another envelope here? No. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. If you don't have this, which it appears that you do not, um, I will make sure that, actually I know you have it electronically because I sent it to you. So I will ask if they will forward it to you. So in the meantime, um, you can jot down notes. It looks like most of you have note-taking paper and I am certainly available for you to ask me questions after today. I don't want anybody to miss the mayor's presentation. So I am Ronnie Haggerty with United Way of Greater Houston. Um, I am responsible for a program that is called the Nonprofit Connection. And what that is is it's a consulting program that serves just nonprofit organizations. We have workshops and seminars, and I hope if you are not already on our um, database email distribution list that you will give me your card or you will contact me and let me know that you'd like to be included. We offer a series of workshops and seminars throughout the year. In fact, this month we have several fundraising series that are going to be very in-depth that I can encourage you to take advantage of. But what we try to do is to provide those services for nonprofit organizations that corporations have available to them all the time. Um, we work primarily with boards of directors because we have observed that boards are often recruited and have no idea what they're doing. They, and shame on us, because in many cases we don't tell them what we want them to do. So that's why we tend to focus our efforts on boards because there is a lot of research that shows that a, a strong board, a working board, is the secret for a successful nonprofit organization. If you don't have a board that's actively involved in your work, it might be time to move those people on and to bring some people on board who are really available, who are passionate about the work that you do, who really understand what your mission is, and who are available to help you. So let's get going. The conversation today is about money. One of the things that I like to start with is, so I'm a potential contributor to your organization. And you come to me and you say, would you give me some money, please? Well, I have a lot of questions before I'm going to consider giving money to you. Why do you want money? How much do you need? What are you going to do with it? Who will manage the money? How do I know when I give you the money that it won't be wasted or it won't be lost or it won't be used for something other than what you're telling me you're going to use it for? And then what are the results? What is the work that you are doing? Are you making your neighborhood safer? Are you giving kids a place to play? Are you providing socialization for seniors? What are the results if I invest in your organization? Because the most important thing I'm going to tell you today is nonprofit organizations are businesses. And they need to operate with the same business best practices that every corporation as we drive up and down the streets here, whether it's HEB or Amogee Bank or the neighborhood dry cleaners. <coughs> Excuse me. You are not going to be successful if you are not serious about the work that you're doing. When we fill out our paperwork with the state to become a nonprofit organization, there are two boxes on that form and one says, I am incorporating as a business or I am incorporating as a nonprofit. It's just a checkbox. That's the only difference. So really think about your organization. Whoever called us nonprofits really didn't do us a favor. Because what does that cause people to think? You don't need money. We don't need to pay people. This is good work. You should do it. You should be happy to do it, right? We, are, we have a different mission, but the work that we do needs to be managed appropriately. So some next questions. 
do you have your information organized in a way that I can review it, that I can assess? Is this an organization that will use my money well? Do they really know what they're doing? Do you have a fundraising plan? We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And do we have an, implement an implementation plan? What that means is you must be able to answer the question, who will do what, by when, and how much is it going to cost? And if you can't answer those questions, you don't know what you're doing. How do we measure success? So we're going to create a program. We know how much money we need for this program. We've got lots of people <coughs> ready to help us deliver this program. How will we know when we've accomplished what we set out to do? Because as an investor, as a donor, as a contributor to your organization, I want to know what success looks like. And so I don't want some vague, fuzzy thing that's, we're going to make Houston a better place to live. Well, we're all trying to do that. So that's not good enough. What is the mission of your organization? Who are you and what do you do? How is your mission different from the mission of an organization down the street or across the city? The mission is where it all starts. Who are you and what do you do? And then the vision. What is the vision for your organization? What's your big dream? If your organization is successful, fill in that blank. Why are you here? Would anybody notice if you went away? Those are important questions for you to consider. So, building a case. This is where you start your fundraising plan. A case is the professional, the, the jargony term that we use to describe creating a fundraising plan. And I like to think about it as a notebook that has tabs. And each of the tabs has different important information about my organization. So one tab might have my bylaws and my articles of incorporation. Another tab might have my budget. Another tab might have information about the programs that we've done. Another one might talk about the history of the organization. So you create it, but what it defines, everything that anybody could want to know about your organization. So there are probably other organizations in town that do something similar to what you do or what you plan to do. How are you different from them? Why are you better? Do you cost more? Are you cheaper? Do you get better results? Just as a point of information, here in the Houston metro area, there are approximately 25,000 nonprofit organizations. Now, about a third of those are churches, synagogues, temples, mosques. But the rest of them are 501c something under the IRS tax exemption code that are looking for the same thing we're all looking for, money and people, money and volunteers. So when I ask who your competition is, don't tell me you don't have any. You may not think they're competitors, but someone else might. So that is why it is so important to have a really clear mission statement and to be able to talk about your organization in a way that sets it apart from those other organizations that we have here in town. So what kind of support do you need? Well, general, general operating support, what is that? That's the basics. That's desks, chairs, tables, computers, internet service, telephone service, staff. If you have the luxury of having staff, how many of you have staff in your organizations? So most of you are, are volunteer-based. Nonetheless, even if you have all volunteers doing the work of your organization, you still have costs of doing business. Maybe it's postage. Uh, maybe it is supplies that you use to provide the programs that you're doing. Those are your operating costs. Then we move into special projects. So this year, you want to redevelop a playground. What are the costs associated with that playground? I know they are, have all kinds of requirements now about the kind of stuff that you have on the ground that the kids can fall on, um, the certain kind of swings that you have to have. There, it used to be in the old days you could just put up a swing and the kids could go out and swing and fall on the dirt and somehow we all survived that, but that's not how we do it anymore. So again, <coughs> what, is, what are the supplies and equipment you need for your program? Capital means building. It means something that is permanent, something that is large and substantial. A playground could be a capital project if it's something that you envision being there for a very long time. But it's typically buildings are what we think about. When you hear people talk about a capital campaign, that usually means they're either refurbishing a building or they're purchasing or building a facility. Uh, do you have cash that you keep for a rainy day? That's your reserve fund. 
Every organization, even if you're on a very small, a very tight budget, should think about that rainy day fund because things happen that you don't expect. And then what do you do? You don't want to stop offering the programs that you're offering. You want to have something to fall back on. Um, have any of you gotten grant money? So then you know that grant money has a lot of strings attached to it. And very often grant money requires that you spend the money before you get reimbursed. I find it really interesting that we are often asked to perform as banks for those who give us grants, for the federal government, for the county, for the city. We do the service and then maybe we have to wait 30, 60, 90 days and we can't charge them interest, right? We just hope that they give us the money and they don't find a mistake in our addition because if they find a mistake in their addition, they're going to send it back to us and we're going to have to start all over again with that report. Sometimes money is too expensive. There are some kind of grants that we can't really afford. Um, th and then endowments, and that's a long-term strategy where you're thinking about um, g make, having people who are in a position to make gifts to your organization that will go into a fund that is used as a foundation for the future. That can be a fairly sophisticated process, and that's why it's at the bottom of the list, because what you first want to do is get yourself into a place where you're stable and sustainable. So what's a good financial base? A good financial base is the, an organization that has different sources of revenue. So you're not dependent just on grants, you're not dependent on corporations or foundations, but you have a nice mix. So there's a study that has been done since the mid-1950s at the Center on Philanthropy at Indiana University. It's called Giving USA. You can Google it. Uh, the results come out every summer and it is a summary of philanthropic giving for the previous year. As long as they have been doing this study, 75% of giving comes not from corporations, not from foundations, from individuals. And so when you're thinking about, well, how do we build the base of support for our organization, it's who you know. It's how do you develop your network. It's friend raising. It's bringing people to the table and getting them interested in your organization. That's why building your case is so important. You don't want to go on stage if you're not ready for prime time. You have to do your homework. You have to be able to tell your story. You have to be able to give people enough information to get interested in and excited about your organization. So foundations are responsible for about 15% of all giving. Corporations are responsible for about 5%. And that 5% has been flat for years. And increasingly, we are seeing that corporate support is international, it's global. So what once upon a time were organizations that gave just here in Houston, they are now giving around the world because they have operations around the world. And so that's, that's been a, a hardship for nonprofits who depended heavily on corporate support. And so when you're working with your volunteers or your board members and they say, well, well, just get more corporations involved, quote the statistics to them, say, that's a good idea, but the best opportunity to go after corporations is through people who work in companies. Corporations are people. Your task is to identify individuals who are associated with spe specific corporations in the city that might be interested in supporting you. So it's a little more complicated <coughs> than it seems. But with our online world, the information is all there. Years ago, doing research on corporations and foundations was like getting a master's degree or getting your PhD. You had to go to the library. You had to drive around town and pick up annual reports. We don't have to do that anymore. It's all online. That's a great way to use your volunteers, to use your board members. Get them to do a little market research for you. Get them to check out your competition. Find out what other organizations like yours in town are doing. Who is supporting them? Because what that does is it tells you who is interested in the kind of work that you're doing. It's a really very helpful way to build that network, to broaden your support. Um, it, when you have a mix of activities, you have a better opportunity to involve different people in the work that you're doing. So where, where do we find money? Fees for service. 
Well, a lot of nonprofits, back to that horrible name nonprofit that they gave us, some people will say, well, we can't charge for our service. I mean, it's interesting that for many people, if it's free, it has no value. And I'm going to, at the risk of offending somebody, I am going to use this morning's program as an example. So there were many, many, many people who signed up for today's program. A lot of those people didn't come because there was no skin in the game, right? If you charge for something, if I've given you $10, I'm probably going to be fairly serious about that commitment that I've made. And the same thing is true with some of the things you do. Perhaps you think, well, we'd like to have an event and have everybody in the neighborhood come for free. Well, that's a nice thing to do, but is that really how you want to operate? And what else does that say to people if your organization is an organization that just does free stuff? What might that suggest to people? It has no value. It has no value. This isn't a very professional operation. I mean, it's an odd psychology, but people really do put value on something where they have to invest a little bit of their own time or money. So the cost can be volunteering an hour of your time. The cost can be $5 for a ticket. The cost can be a dollar to take a chance on a raffle. But when it is free, there is that interesting perception that people have, well, maybe it's really not worth very much. So we talked about government funding opportunities. <coughs> Depending on the size of your organization, there are not many good opportunities for government funding for a smaller organization. The city from time to time has um, opportunities. United Way has a program that's called Community Building Grants, and those are grants of from five to $10,000. They are one-time grants, but if you have a special project, a new program, a one-time activity that you are working on, I encourage you to look on our website at community building grants because that would be a good opportunity for you. There aren't many of those small grants for smaller, newer organizations, but there are some. I'm back to the market research. That's a good project to get some of your volunteers to help you with, to call the city, to call the county, to explore online what grants might be available for recreational programming or seniors programming or dogs and cats programming, whatever it happens to be. Uh, we talked about foundations, businesses, individuals, three stars by the individuals, memberships. So perhaps you have an organization where a membership program would make sense. And, and for $3 or $5 a year, you are a member, you get first chance at the activities, you get to come in early, you get to use the facilities before anybody else does. So what membership program could you create for a modest price that would offer special benefits to your members? People like to be members of things, and it doesn't have to be expensive. We talk about plans gift as being very sophisticated. The most common way many of our organizations raise money is events. Events are the most expensive way to raise money because People get this idea, I know, let's have a barbecue. And we'll charge $25 for the tickets, and we'll rent a space to have the barbecue, we'll buy tablecloths and napkins and decorations, and before you know it, you've spent more money than you're going to make with your $25 ticket. So events are important because they do help us raise money, they are useful because they're really good marketing tools for your organization. By having an event, you bring people together and you introduce them to the work of your organization. It's a chance to tell your stories. It's a chance for people to meet others who are involved in the organization. But before you plan an event, sit down and do the math. How much is it going to cost us? How much revenue will we bring in? Is that going to balance? Are we going to lose money? You don't have to make money necessarily, but you surely don't want to lose money. And I encourage people before they start any event to do a cost-benefit analysis. Add up all your costs. What are all the things, the, the silly little magic markers and table decorations and the materials, the crayons and the coloring sheets for the kids? What is it that you are going to spend money on? And then where will the money come from? Can you be confident that you're going to break even on that event. In-kind gifts are 
probably gifts that you are pretty good at securing. It's going to HEB and asking them if they would contribute food to an activity that you're doing. It might be going to Office Depot or Staples and asking if they could contribute copy, copy paper. My theory is it never hurts to ask. All someone can say is no. And if you're in the friend raising business, you might have to get that skin thickened up a little bit because just don't take it personally. That's why, I'm back to my case statement again, that's why it is so important for you to have your presentation, for you to have your speech, for you to have your talking points ready to go. So that if I'm approaching Kroger's or HEB or a local garden store to provide plants for the tables, that I can tell them about my organization, I can tell them about the important work that we do in the community, I can let them know the value. And then what are they going to get for it? Are you going to have signage around that says these table decorations were contributed by Kroger? Are you going to have their names on the program? Are you going to advertise their contributions in advance of the event? So part of what you need to be prepared to offer someone you're asking an in -kind, for an in-kind donation is, what's in it for them? What are they going to get out of it? It's, a, it's an exchange. It's a business expense for them if they give you in-kind merchandise. They're more likely to do it if they can see that you are going to be telling their potential customers how wonderful they are. That's what they want to know. So how do we diversify fundraising? So how, among all of you this morning, how many of you probably get most of your money from events? Okay, so a few. Where else is your money coming from? Pardon? From tithing, okay. Uh, students. Students, okay. Hey, you're, con you're contributing it uh, out of your own pocket, okay. And that's how a lot of organizations start. And I, to talk about that business, analogy again, if you are starting a small business, and that's really what a new nonprofit is as a small business, it takes three to five years for a small business to make a profit. It takes three to five years before you really have a sense of whether this is a going concern. And <coughs> going into starting a nonprofit, I think a lot of people assume, again, there's that nonprofit name, they think, well, it's probably going to be easy to start a nonprofit. And I, you know, I probably won't have any expenses and people will contribute to my organization and none of that's, you're shaking your head like a <laughs> voice of experience there. None of that is really very true. It is hard work. The more you put in place in terms of a good plan, really thinking about the stories that you want to tell, the marketing that you're going to do, you know, how are you going to, what are the messages that you need to develop, that you're going to share with the community to get people involved in who you are and what you do. Um, take advantage of volunteers. I think we're kind of in a time where the word volunteer is almost insulting. Many times people look at volunteers, or we look at volunteering ourselves and we say, you know, that, that kind of doesn't strike me as a very positive description. So I like to use the term pro bono, that, which means um, for good in Latin, but pr I talk about pro bono consultants or pro bono um, gardeners or pro bono. That sounds much more elegant. It sounds much more like something I wouldn't mind giving my time to because what I'm observing is that people are valuing their time more than their money, that everyone is running in so many different directions that they're actually find it easier to give you a credit card or write you a check than to give you an hour or two of their time. And so it's really important to think about when we're recruiting for volunteers, what do we want people to do? When we just say, I need you to help. Okay, I'm here. What do you want me to do? And there's nothing worse than a volunteer who comes to give his or her time and it's wasted. Nobody seems to know what the tasks are. Everybody's disorganized. They leave. They're not happy because they came prepared to do something, they didn't feel appreciated, and what are they going to do? They might put that on Facebook, don't ever do that, or they will tell their friends. Sadly, people rarely tell us when things are wonderful, 
And they often don't tell us when things are awful, but they tell everybody else. And so that's what we need to be sure, that when we have volunteers that are involved with us, that they're having a really good experience. <coughs> we talked about doing a cost-benefit assessment of all of the activities. What is it going to cost you before you launch this? What we don't like are surprises. We want to be sure that we are prepared for what's coming ahead. Uh, what kind of skills do we need? So when we think about a project that you're getting ready to launch, what kind of support from those pro bono assistants do you need? Do you need somebody who can update your website? Do you need somebody who can put a Facebook page together for you? Do you need somebody who can help you with flyers or who has access to a copier and will make lots of copies for you? What are the skills that you need? And that's part of what you're figuring out for your plan of action before you ever bring anybody into the room to talk to them about what the project is all about. Um, and then what are the tools? Do you, what kind of hardware do you need? What kind of software? There are all kinds of resources in Houston. There's the Houston Tool Bank, for example, where you can rent tools. If you're going to do a landscape project or a gardening project, you can rent tools from the Houston Tool Bank. You don't have to go out and buy things. They're there. There are many resources that are available to you. How many of you are familiar with 2-in-1 Texas United Way Helpline? OK, well, I want you to plant that in your brain. 2-in-1 Texas United Way Helpline is a 24-hour helpline with social service resources. So whether it's looking for after school care, help with seniors, food pantries, uh, rental housing, anything that you can imagine that might be in support of a nonprofit organization, 2 in one Texas United Way Helpline. It's a free call. As I said, there's somebody there 24-7, 365 days a year. It's a great resource. People sometimes call about the time and the weather, and we don't necessarily <laughs> have that information available, but we try to be helpful if we can. We just uh, 2 one one That's it. Okay. 2 one one and there a human being will answer the phone and try to help you connect with three resources. Of, so it, and anything that you can think about in the social service arena, if you're looking for um, substance abuse, counseling, um, child care, Whatever it is, there will be able to help you with that. But something like the tool bank would be something that would be in the database. That um, so as you're thinking about work that you're doing, and you might say, well, where are the community centers located in my neighborhood? Because everything is by zip code. We can check by zip code. We can check by name of organization or by type of organization. So keep that in mind. It's an easy way to get information. So how much money do we actually need? What were your expenses last year? Do you think there are some, are you going to be able to get some of those things in kind that you had to pay for last year because you, you figured out what you needed and now maybe you think, well, we went out to the Houston Garden Center and brought those geraniums ourselves. I wonder if we went back and asked them to donate half a dozen of them, if they would be willing to do that, if we would include them in our marketing for our activities. Um, what new programs are you looking to launch? And everybody says, oh, I don't know how to do a budget. A budget is so hard. And I sympathize. I don't like numbers. I can always feel my brain kind of shutting down when I start to think about numbers. But really, budgeting is very easy. It is very tedious. It really requires sitting down and going step by step by step. OK, let's think about how are we going to do this program? What is the first thing that, well, we need a space for it. OK, can we get our church to donate a room when there's no Bible study going on? Or do I actually have to rent space? So this is just an aside. If you are not aware of the fact that United Way has free meeting space for nonprofits um, available during weekdays, it is available on Saturday and evenings. There's a small charge for security on Saturday and evenings. You can't fundraise there, but you can have meetings, board meetings. You can do training. There are all kinds of activities that you can do in United Way space at no cost at all. So again, the resources are out there. You have to do some research. Yes? Do they have a price for people who are just operating under You have to be a nonprofit. It, you have to be a 501 something or other. It's usually 501c3s primarily because, as you can imagine, we're the only free space in town. And so we are already booked well into 2019. That doesn't mean we wouldn't have a small re meeting room available if you were to call. So it is, it is, you have to be a nonprofit. It's, and we get that question a lot. Yes? So can I ask, like, if you're partnering with a nonprofit, the nonprofit can get the space and you're having a meeting with the nonprofit? 
you have to be with them. Yes, but but that will work, right? Are there area, areas of the city that don't have a lot of United Way uh, space? So like I'm, I'm from Acres Home, and mm -hmm. I have no idea of anything from United Way. I think maybe the Boys and Girls Club. But like, because people from my neighborhood, they don't leave the neighborhood. Right. So if I want right. to do some sort of nonprofit thing, they're going to have to leave the neighborhood in order to do that. I guess my question, I guess that's a two one one. Well, no, probably uh, they would be able to tell you what is in the neighborhood right. by zip code. Yes, so that would be a good starting point. Um, in terms of, and we do have organizations that we fund in across the city. Okay. Um, we have what we call United Way centers in Fort Bend, in the Bay Area, in Montgomery County, and in Waller County. Those buildings have space in them that is available. Okay, I got the 10 minute sign, I gotta talk fast. So, but, but you know, churches and schools are among the very best places to share space because they may have Bible study on the weekend and on Wednesday night, but they may have space that's available at other times during the week. And you know, it's the kind of thing that you wouldn't wanna approach it in a very business-like manner. You would want to have some sort of a written agreement. Here's the day of the week that we wanted, the hours. We will make sure it's all clean when we leave. Um, but I've found that churches are very willing to make space available. And quite often, um, community centers, the, multi the city multi-service centers have space. Again, it takes some homework. It takes some time to dig it out, talking to other people. Where do you meet? Where do you hold your events? What, what luck have you had? finding something in this general area. So again, is it, right. is it easy? No, but, but it's, it may well be there. Even a restaurant would have to be out. That's true, a lot, of, a lot of restaurants have private rooms and they know what their busy times of day are. In the middle of the afternoon, probably the restaurant's not very busy. And if they may have a requirement that you purchase nachos and Coke, but usually that can be a really affordable place, yes. Oh, that's true, the library, right? The downtown library is totally refurbished and I know a lot of us don't like to go downtown because of parking, but there are libraries all over town. That's a really good idea. So see, you've got some possibilities already. Okay, um, where can we find more money? People who already support you are your best customers. So if you're in sales and marketing, whether you're selling aluminum siding or cars or groceries, your current customers are the most likely source of more money. And that's true in the <coughs> nonprofit world. People who already support us are more likely to help us with additional contributions or help us connect with other people. So if you've got some folks that have been supporting you, it's perfectly fair to say, do you know any of your friends, coworkers, family members who might be interested in this work? Would you be willing to connect us? That's part of your friend raising. Talked about fees for service. Grant funding, so I gave you the United Way Community Building Grants. Um, Episcopal Health Charities, I don't know, Episcopal Health Foundation, they used to be the charities. Episcopal Health Foundation is primarily where they started was funding health programs and projects, but they define health very differently from the way we define it, that a, a safe and, and um, welcoming community is important for the health of the residents of those communities. So check out their website, that there may be grant opportunities there. Again, figure out who is funding community activities and determine whether you or perhaps a collection of organizations that nonprofit foundations are very interested in collaborative funding these days. So if you could put together a group of organizations either in your in Fifth Ward in your neighborhood or in different neighborhoods around the city to do health education or after school programming. There are many opportunities that partnerships could help you generate more money. Um, reducing costs is always an obvious way to save money, but you can't reduce your way to success. At some point in time, you have to start raising money. And then we talked about special events. Um, so who can we ask to support us? Family are, you probably already tapped them out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, I've been doing this for a while. Friends, um, social acquaintances, neighbors, um, people from people in your church community, people in your faith community. 
um, coworkers, club members, people that you, that you walk with, run with, ride bikes with, um, exercise with, leisure contacts, professionals, where, where do you get your hair cut? Um, where do you buy shoes? Where, think of all of the activities that you are involved with, one at a time, because we all say we don't know anybody, right? I don't know anybody. Yes, you do. And my challenge to you is, have a meeting of your board, and you are all required by law, if you are a, an incorporated nonprofit organization, to have a board of at least three people. Make sure that your board is prepared to help you prospect. So what I like to do is post a lot of flip chart, those big white sheets of paper on the wall, and go through category by category. Who are your neighbors? Who do you work with? Who are your friends? Who do you bike with? Where do your kids go to school? Who are their teachers? You can fill a fair number of sheets of paper with people that you forgot you knew. And then start to think about how do we get them involved with the work that we're doing? Because it's going to be a different strategy for different people. But you start with figuring out who they are. Okay, make that list. Practice. So it, asking for money is not something everybody is comfortable with. Anybody in sales here? So if anybody in sales is probably, okay, I have five minutes. Anybody in, people who do sales are pretty comfortable asking for money because sale, fundraising is sales. The product is different. So it's not the easiest thing to walk up to somebody and say, would you contribute to my organization? Well, that's not a good way to start. My question to you is, have you ever, fill in the blank, about the activities of your organization? So before you ask for money, practice. Get together as a team and you ask her and she asks you, figure out how it felt, work the kinks out of it. It's like going on stage. You would not go on stage for a performance if you didn't practice. And what happens is we ask people to cold call. Well, cold calling doesn't work for, does it work for you when somebody calls you up out of the blue? I mean, the good news now is that you have caller ID, you don't have to pick up the phone, right? But now they've got cell phone numbers I've discovered. You can block it, okay. So with, with fundraising, cold call doesn't work either. We have to figure out how, what are you interested in? Are you interested in kids? Are you interested in seniors? Let's have a conversation about that. I don't ask for money right away. I, I talk to you first, yes? You've got three minutes left. Can you tell us what <laughs> programs are available at United Way that we can go to to get the rest of this information? Well, in, in a general way, as I said, our workshops that are on our website the, under United Way, Houston.org is our website. Um, the Nonprofit Connection tab, the first listing at the top of the list is the workshops, are the workshops and the seminars that we have coming up over in the next couple of weeks. Um, in term, we have a lot of information electronically, so if you want particular subject matter, um, I can send you something. If you want a sample fundraising plan, if you want um, how to write bylaws, uh, we probably have almost anything you can think of in terms of, of subject matter. Um, I have cards up here and you are most willing to email me. The easiest thing to do is to email Nonprofit Connection, UnitedWayHouston.org, and we'll, we get all of those emails and then we will respond to them as quickly as we can. So let's, um, how do we create a fundraising plan? You have to identify your goals, um, determine what is reasonable, create an action plan, set deadlines, assign, as I said, who will do, it's one sentence, who will do what, by when, and how much is it going to cost? That's your fundraising plan right there. Is it easy? No. A budget is a work of fiction. A budget is based on what you knew in the past. It, it, there's no guarantee that next year will deliver the same thing, but you have to at least know what your target is. So, all right, we are at time to wrap up. It looks like everybody is, yes? Will there a sign in so you'll be able to send us um, PowerPoint? What is the best way? Is it, you have it, so if you can okay. send it to the people who have signed up, um, that's the most efficient thing to do. They have the, they have the whole PowerPoint. Thank you very much for being here this morning. I'm sorry that our time got cut a little bit, but um, we will, we'll look for chapter two, right? <laughs>